Greetings everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're playing as the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altay. So if you'd like to read about the country information, please go right ahead, and we'll scroll down for you as well, and there's some more paragraphs for you, just to understand where we are at, how we got here, and to appreciate the art on the right side of the screen here. Onwards, cool, let's begin with the focus. Landing or Land of the Strong, the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altay is a large splendor state that's separated from the Central Siberian Republic, even rivaling its remnants to the north in terms of power and military might. Its president, the aviator Alexander Pokrishkin, who is commonly known as a falcon, runs the state in an increasingly authoritarian manner. Novosibirsk has also been overwhelmed by the wave of refugees that came from the evacuation eastward, which has caused a multitude of issues. The falcon and his government will have to find solutions to the problems that have started to torment its people if he's to unite the region. And we gotta use some military factories. We got some guns, support equipment, anti tank. I believe we could probably use a good amount of uh, artillery. Even though, actually, we need motorized before artillery. Uh, let's see. Mods we're using are obviously TNO, uh, player of the peace conferences, which doesn't really matter, as well as state center tool mod. If in case things get really weird. One, two, three, four, five, six tanks. No IFVs here. Fighters, which is hard to see sometimes. And some casts. And so we don't get tempted. Goodbye. Cool, and let us continue going on. Uh, we are currently... Oh, crush your agitators, look at that. Narod, Narodnik investigation, that's kind of cool. Uh, but we are currently on patch cutting for room G, so there it is what it is. And at the time of this recording, this is probably the last campaign that we will play on using cutting room floor patch G. Just let you guys know that. As well as, I want to talk about the thumbnail a little bit. Um, so the thumbnail, it's a little bit different than normal, and if you're wondering what building that is, that is the Novosibirsk Railway uh, building, I believe, that was opened up in 1893. I thought I might try something a little bit different. Cool, and with this, I'm not even going to use Warlord Development, because we have the legacy of the Siberian plan. Worker discontent is medium, so the last time I remembered playing in Central Siberia, with this whole uh, legacy of the Siberian plan, you see that worker discontent? It doesn't matter, don't worry about it, but the beginning... Alexander Morokin shoved his hands into the pockets of his jacket. As he walked down the streets of the Novosibirsk, his hands shook as he approached the warehouse. He glanced down the way, back the way he came, half expecting to see corporate goons following him. Up ahead, he could see a red ribbon wrapped around the pole, light pole. He, the greed upon signal that the meeting was on. Alexander was taking the biggest risk of his life in going to this meeting, but he was desperate. The factory he worked at had been bought out by the Sibir Corporation, and the new regulations they had imposed had left him practically penniless. He could only just afford his room at the flop house and went without food on most nights. He knocked on the door in the appropriate pattern and waited. The door opened and he was dragged inside in the dim light of a candle. He could see a group of five men and women gathered around what looked like a floor plan of a factory. The woman who dragged him through the door looked up him, looked him up and down before gesturing towards the table. Welcome, comrade. Tell me why are you here, she demanded. To fight for the people of Novosibirsk and to end the tyranny of the Silovic regime, he responded. He had read the pamphlets and attended a couple of secret meetings before this, though none as important as this one. The woman looked satisfied by his response, if not particularly enthused. The woman looked back over the floor plan before she spoke again. Welcome, Comrade Silni. We must prepare you for your first assignment. The pigs at the Sibir Corporation have opened a new manufacturing plant for the production of top-of-the-line small arms. It will be our job to relieve the plant of its new manufacturing specs and to cause as much damage to the plant as we can. Alexander, or Comrade Silni, well, he was, as he was now known as, felt his throat tighten as a submachine gun was pressed into his hands. Any second thoughts were quickly silenced by the, fir by the fire he saw in the woman's eyes. This was for the people. It would all be worth it in the end. The revolution finds its roots it find its roots <clears throat> in the young, in the internal situation. The champions of industry, the veterans of the Siberian War. Not bad. Shock troops look pretty good. I like that. Even though you get more armor speed, we don't have any armor. We have guns, but training elite soldiers now? Ooh, that's not bad. Mechanized infantry would be kind of nice. The fruits of the Siberian plant. Industrial equipment goes up. It's always good to double check these um, before you know you do too much. What do we have? Legacy of the Siberian plant, obviously, which is pretty good. We have disproportionate population, which is not great, uh, but not bad. All Siberian army, not terrible. Um, and the Novo Siberian aircraft plant, which is not bad. What is this? Oh! Oh, no, do we have to deal with... Oh, crud. We have to deal with voting? But I love my authoritarian nations. We, did, we have to vote? Or, the, or, or this is about corporations. We get more division attack, look at that. Whoa, a corporation is founded by a bunch of people. The Sibir Association. Oh, whoa. Titan? Research facility? Ooh, that's not very good for us. And the people. 
uh, Naruto Nick threat ended. Due to our efforts and efforts of the SB, it seems that we've successfully contained the Naruto Nick threat. The investigations by our agents and those undercover provided enough evidence for the rest, and the raid could have gone better, despite a heavy firefight. Many of the Naruto Nicks have been put behind bars, and it seems like the rest have gone into hiding in Flay Devil Spirisk. We won't have to worry about any more major damage in the future, and our government has begun to congratulate the efforts of those involved on the ground in bringing the terrorists down. With the Naruto Nick threat gone, we will no longer have to worry about our factories being sabotaged, or rail lines being destroyed. Our Federation is stronger than anyone who may want to topple it. Um, okay, great. I didn't do anything about them, but sure, why not? The security question, meet with Shushkin. Naruto next. Um, replace... Ooh. More cost, but that doesn't really matter to us right now. So, lots of black consumption is pretty good. Worker discontent, more stability would be very good. Glory to the Pioneers, a Titan. Versus people. The Rising Phoenix. The Siberian Bear. The Champions of Industry. Well, I do want to get industrial equipment, but it seems like we'll get there so late. Ooh, consumer goods goes down. Ooh, get more military factories, though. And I want to make sure we get enough stuff first. So let's do Veterans of the Siberian War. Why not? One of the greatest advantages Nova Zabirsk has over its regional opponents is our comparatively large and experienced army. An army whose soldiers cut their teeth on the front lines of the Siberian War before our eventual secession from the Republic that has gone, or since, shrunk back into Tomsk. By studying the past battles and examining our successes and failures, we can improve the effectiveness of our forces. The experience of our troops will likely give us a great advantage in future conflict, as the armies of our neighbors remain undisciplined and under-equipped, which is a very, very good thing. Now we can build new schools, we can prepare some raids. Now I want to raid against Orochia, which probably shouldn't be too bad, but let's see, we got some of the stuff here. Improve extraction stuff, worker concessions, we don't like that for now. Ooh, less stability, I don't want to do that. Production quotas, factory output might not be too bad. Construction speed would be pretty darn good, but hurts our consumer goods. So we'll do that, and we'll do that, since we have enough PP right for now. And then we'll go probably with anything else that gives us better consumer goods, maybe industrial capacity. Uh, no, that's not very good. I'm going to go do that one, too. Cool. Evening tides, evening past Alexander Postkrishkin, like a warm sun sun sunset tinged blur. The president of the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altai, to use his long form title that even he found somewhat cumbersome, was hosting a dinner to honor the veterans of the Great Patriotic War. A few of them were his friends, but all of them were comrades in a neatly ceramic tiled dining chamber. The baldy jokes of the Aces echoed down the silent halls, booming through the rooms of the presidential palace. Some of them did not partake in the festive occasions, however. Sitting on the edges of the crowds were silent onlookers whose faces were tinted with the colorless pallor, a joy at long loss. The war might have left no Sibirsk and Alte for now, for these had never left them. Call it battle fatigue, shell shock, Pokrishkin sighed, there was no cure to the eternal affliction of soldiers. A hand tapped his shoulder as Mr. President. A powerful voice thundered behind him, catching Pokrishkin off guard. Long time no see, the man looked askance at him if, as if expecting a trigger to click in his head. I, the man started, his voice quieter than normal. Uh, we were in the academy before, you know, the flight school. Uh-huh, nice to meet you, mister. Apologies, it's been a bit. Surely you can understand the occasional forgetfulness of my part. No, 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 that's not important. A hand waved his apology off. Still got your head in the clouds? Pokrishkin arced a curious eyebrow. I don't seem to recall. Can I entreat you to light me? No need. Pokrishkin watched as he left past the crowd and into the night. Curious fellow. If not us, then who? Foreman Kostim had heard it first from Yegor, the, mi the miner with the bright blue eyes who had been a worker in the mine for over ten years. Kostin had not wanted to believe it, but after the third retelling, it had to begin to sink in his head. Now, the news was not mere rumor of Silvic. It was not mere rumor or Silvic propaganda. The narrowed Nicks have been defeated. Their leadership gunned down or rounded up in a recent raid in the code of a long and brutal struggle between the state and the socialists. Kostin angrily hacked away the stone with his pick, wishing desperately that the reverse had been true. Capitalist oppression continued and the dawn seemed very far away indeed. As he used his suit, blackened hands to load chunks of stone into the nearby cart, another thought occurred. Was the dawn so far away indeed? The narrowed Nicks had failed in their mission, but so had too. The state expended a great deal of time and resources put down by them. The Silvic Nicks were raw, vulnerable. Suddenly, Kostin, tin, Kostin grinned. His white teeth flashing brightly in the darkness. The iron was hot. The workers furious. Perhaps the second revolt would be what was needed to bring the whole structure crashing down. The worker eternal endures all hardships and Morgan Bogatir. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. This happens every campaign. And quiet flows the ob. Vasily Shushkin loved to use used to love sitting by the river Ob, back when he had first accepted mayorship of Barnal, in the infancy of Pokrishkin's new state. It was a beautiful time of unfettered idealism and shaky hope in a murky future. And in between debates and briefings, Ob's glittering way waters were always waiting for him. He would find a perch on the rocks, gazing out of the gently rippling waters and listening to the distant cries of birds over the murmur of the river. Idle thoughts would drift, la drift lazily through his head, or, on some days, he would scribble away at some unborn writing project or simply lay upon the shore in a half-sleep stupor dreaming of things to come now, however. Things were changing. The waters were getting filthier by the day as more businesses moved into town, raising factories and more 
along Ob's Bay. Although the Federation and Shushkin's own values lay upon the freedom, he could not help but feel perhaps it was leniency that had allowed these industrials to lay claim to his home. In several meetings, Shushkin had brought up his misgivings with the direction of the town's development, only to find many of his trusted aides in the pocket of the very same hounds preying upon Barnal's newfound prosperity. Thus, he went out to the river once again to think. Shushkin felt conflicted with the idea of pushing the pocketed officials out, as each had gotten their own through their own merit. Part of them felt it was vanity, the idea of holding something as trivial as the beauty of the nostalgic river over his own values. In the fields just beyond the river, however, he saw men breaking their backs for a day's wage dropped like crumbs by richer men. Was this corruption in and of itself a greater tyranny? Still, he... He would have to tackle this problem some other way. But how? When it felt like he could only see Russia's pain. Is he all alone? Maybe. And we'll shock troops, the skies are open, mechanized stuff, APCs, um, a house divided. Uh, let's get some oh, blueprints for guns. <clears throat> our generals have devised a plan to expand the scope of our armed forces by investigating a special training designed to improve our unit's ability to strike fast and effectively through opposing armies. These soldiers will be skilled in breaking through enemy front lines and limiting the amount of damage for tr future wars will have on our army and citizenry. Furthermore, deployment of these elite troops will certainly continue to heighten our military edge over the rest of the region and deter any warlord or state foolish enough to plan an invasion against us and up in the sky. As his old plan, a gift from the free aviators weave through the skies, Alexander Pokrishkin, or maybe I'm saying that wrong, Pokrishkin, yeah, I'm saying it right, I think, could not help but reminisce about the war. <clears throat> he remembered the sounds of explosions, the shrieking of rent, rending metal, and the screams of wounded men. He remembered the words of Horst Wessler Lied, as the Germans blared it from every radio tower in Moscow, and last of all, he remembered the flight east, and the tens of hundreds of thousands of good people who had perished to the jackboots in an inexorable march. <clears throat> That was all lost, though, he told himself. As he watched the ground underfoot, the anti soldiers that drilled on top of it, he had this. Pokrishkin didn't want to be a leader to fight a squadron, to a flight squadron, much less a state, and yet those under his care had not only survived, but they had thrived. Things weren't perfect, of course, but the terrorists plaguing his lens were proof of that. But nevertheless, life was tolerable. It pushed the stick forward, a smile filling his weathered face as he dived down. He never really had time to fly these days, nor the opportunity. Always an AA gun from Tomsk or Kemerovo, always a Kazakh raiding part of that straight too far. Always a foe that he needed combating, but today was not one of those days, today he was free. As he wheeled around to face home, Pokrishkin couldn't help but marvel at the city of his forces control. The smoke of the factories of Novosibirsk was almost comforting, and the distant booming and lights of artillery that had once been terrifying felt in some strange way familial. He hadn't wanted to be a leader, but he knew that if he did not fight for his people, then someone far worse than he would. As long as he still drew breath, the Siberian falcon would defend the people of Novosibirsk, and perhaps one day all of Russia. Perhaps a day, a dove will fly again too. And Goring is the successor of Hitler. Good luck with that, son. The silent warfare, the Silovic state had a unique resource when compared to the other warlords of Russia. While others may have had to rely on ideological similarities, violence, or tense negotiations to work with other warlords, the Silovic state can dig the claws into a nation without them even realizing it. They can tip their rivals for unification in the direction of their own interests. This resource allows the state to snake its way into the government of their rival, slowly aligning the opponent's interests with their own through gradual takeover or several all sectors of government and even daily life. This resource, of course, is a vast and powerful businesses at the Silovic state disposal. In addition to the political, economic, and military pressure that they can put on their neighbors, see, corporations have a funny way of getting what they want from a country. Its people and a government, if they're more powerful than their targets or clients, are stubborn. <clears throat> economic pressure and integration is a mighty thing in the first step to that oh-so-gradual takeover that the Silovic state relies on to move forward a bloodless but dirty alternative. I don't know, shock troops. Uh, yes. Yes, please. And I would like to raid some people. A hero of the people, though. <clears throat> Comrade Sidney walked through the brightly lit halls of the bunker here in the HQ of the Narodnik movement. He felt a free in a way it never be be felt before. Though his useful face was now marred by shrapnel scars, his smile on his lips could not be denied. His comrade stopped and saluted as he passed, a fact which took him by surprise even now after, a month, after months among the ranks. <clears throat> He walked into the deepest layers of the bunker towards the command center. As he walked, he could not help but feel reminiscence. Reminiscence. His first mission with the Narodniks had been a resounding success. The plan had been destroyed, and the weapons schematics had been too vital to continue to the continued success of the movement. From there, Sinia had participated in countless operations against Federation forces and the corporations they served. Magnates and politicians had fallen by the hands. Entire Federation supply convoys had been hijacked and diverted. In a particularly memorable mission, he had destroyed an entire Titan manufacturing plant with little more than a pipe bomb and a well-placed bottle of American soda. Finally, he entered the command center. Every surface was covered in mass mission briefings and reports. Out of the center of this controlled chaos was the leader of the movement, Comrade Chiarni. Chiarni was an old grizzled veteran of the Great Patriotic War. <clears throat> 
Welcome back, comrade Sydney. Hope you're well rested. It is come to f time to come forward to with our decapitation strike. The dude at Pokrishkin will be attending the demonstration of some new kind of fighter plane. It will be your duty to kill the dude. Sinier was in shock. The magnitude of his mission eclipsed any he had embarked on before. Pokrishkin's death would be the culmination of years of planning, but it all came down to him. He was ready. Pride goeth before fall. Memories of the war. Uh, Pavlodar. Hold on. Before we do that, let's see. How strong is Pavlodar? Ah, Sabit Mukhanov. They have up to five divisions. We have five divisions as well. Uh, as much as I want to separate these guys, you guys have more attack over there, so... I guess we'll see what happens. We're close, but... Gentlemen, it is an honor to have Mr. Surabov, a veteran of the legendary Siberian War, here with us today. Please welcome him. The applause as a respected veteran rose from his seat was much louder than when he seemingly irrelevant commander had stood up to introduce him. After greeting his old friends, he sat down again to speak to the young recruits about his experience. Question after question, he answered them all directly and with honesty. Mr. Surabov, how did you come to be an instructor in the Federation's army, one of the soldiers asked. <clears throat> The veteran was quick to reply. You see, back when I was in the army, things were not so bright in these lands. The old republic was fighting a seemingly endless war against the Agoda's hawks, but it was failing, and I felt like I had to do something about it. That was when I met President Pokrishkin, <clears throat> who was one of the few to look at the situation not through an overly idealistic lens. He was interrupted by someone asking if he had re really met the president, but he shrugged it off as nothing too important. He was planning to bring peace to Novosibirsk and Altay, and decided to join him here, or join him in the endeavor. As you know, he succeeded, and here we are. Mr. Surabov, if it, is it true you fought off a communist tank on your own? That is a real story, yes, he replied checkingly or chuckling he, we had been in the forest up north when we were attacked by a tank unit i was away from my platoon but i was quick enough to grab an old anti-tank weapon and fire it. unfortunately others were not so lucky one of my friends died trying to distract an invading uh, unit there was silence for a moment but the mission was so successful it was sacrifices like these that got us to where we are now it is sacrifices like these that will be necessary to restore order to the nation and once and for all any other questions old soldiers never die but we can get some more equipment probably that'd be pretty darn good to get Guys, well, wow, look at that. It's going up by 0.6. It's going down. Okay, that's kind of cool with the uh, whole corporation stuff here. Army professional still going up as well. Uh, looks like a lot of people don't have any loot, which kind of sucks. I was hoping to raid some other people, but whatever. The skies are, all, are ours. An air force is a rare asset to any force in Central Siberia, or indeed the rest of Russia, but Novosibirsk was fortunate enough to inherit the majority of the CSR's air force, along with excuse me, many of its officers who now make up our government. Included among the officers who set up the new government is President Prokrishkin, the Siberian Falcon himself. Improvement of the existing infrastructure and air bases, as well as the development of new technology for our air force, has proven a popular idea amongst these ministers who plan to push forward these proposals. The skies of Central Siberia will remain ours, of course, to control. God, I want to raid people. Come on, let me raid. We do have 72 political power. Margilov's men. Looking on in disgust, General Vasily Margilov reviewed the airborne troops before him. While they were certainly finer men than the most the Federation had to offer, the, that currently did not mean much. They were relatively out of shape, possessed outdated, outdated equipment, and most of all were simply outraged to any general with good sense, which Margilov liked to consider himself to be. It didn't matter, or if he didn't know, he'd swear that some of these men were more rat-eaten than their parachutes, though that wasn't saying much. They needed modernization badly, especially in these times, with the Federation surrounded by enemies and potential enemies. There was no question about that. The only training or question was was, how should we go about modernizing them? Their training was in the most obvious need of a reform, so certainly he should start there. Even if it required the most finest of materials, they'd still be no good they'd be no good in the hands of men unworthy of holding them. One of the airborne troops was startled awake by his passing, nearly falling over, and Margolov glared at the man in contempt. This was certainly going to be a long and arduous journey. At least it isn't too late. Good. I see production efficiency goes down. Maximum IC goes up though. Uh let's do that one. Nice. Weekly business. A save out scan the uh, plaza marketplace. In a rural community not too far away from Nova Sibirsk, only a few peasants set up their stalls this early in the morning. Terrible security had for the president of the Federation to be in public for something as mundane as a meeting. Yet Seva also knew that Nova Sibirsk, a little display of trust, often went a long way. A soldier looked toward, looked toward the reinforced limousine behind him. His boss was of no doubt thinking about the meeting ahead or thinking about the other meetings of the day. Or not thinking at all, daydreaming about whatever it was that the Siberian Falcon occupied his mind with. Sevia knew he couldn't keep up with his boss. That was why the boss was, well, the boss. Another dark limousine. A lone man came out of the car, hands empty. Seva stepped forward, his hands away from his own weapon. Mr. Janiszkiewski, he asked. The man shook his head. Opened the door to reveal his own boss, a short, stocky type. Seva recognized the man, a former military intelligence ass analyst. Behind Seva, the door opened. President Pokrishkin emerged from his vehicle. Any tension from the meeting evaporated as a bodyguard stepped aside, and the two powerful men shook hands and exchanged formalities. Seva soon found himself holding a crate of documents. Janiszkiewski's bodyguard held a manila folder. What was in it? Pokrishkin often gave money to financial insider news in such a courtesy call. 
Chinyashevsky was an up-and-coming Silovic, a man with a growing network of his own. It was good business to pay respect to the men of his caliber. The conversation over, Chinyashevsky disappeared into the car and drove away at high speed. Silva took note of the rifle men on the roof relaxing their stance. It paid to be prepared for anything when one worked in the business of presidential security. The bodyguard sat in the back of Paul Krishkin's car, finally allowing himself a moment of rest. His boss looked at a particularly jovial mood, leafing through the intelligence report. The president smiled contentedly. It seems like the old man Pasternak is on the move again. War boss, if I ask? Paul Krishkin shook his head and smiled, though. No, not war, but perhaps the end of peace. Russia's looking up, keeping an ear to the ground. And actually, I didn't do this yet. We do have some plans, which is pretty good. Obviously, we need way more, but it's all right. We could train these guys, but then we lose a few planes. I don't want to lose any planes yet, so we'll see. Cool. Oh, can we do anything here? Implement war concessions? Or oh, worker concessions? Ah, uh, discontent. And whatever. Mechanized infantry. As one of the few states of Russia that still maintains a capable and de decently sized industry, we should use it to our advantage and expand our on or upon our mechanized... Mechan Mechanized forces. Our Federation's armed forces will gain a great technological advantage as other states remain comparatively unarmored. The increased maneuverability will also help to capitalize on any breakthrough we make, which will make us become an unstoppable military force. It gets more APC 50 APCs and some motorized equipment, which is okay. It's not great, but it's okay. Resource extraction, decreased consumer goods, factories, and construction speed. Not really worth it, man. This one, factory IC discontent. Um, I do want to get more factory IC, but maybe we'll save our PP for now. Because we only have so much PP in the early game here. Flying towards the future. As Ahmad Khan Sultan roared above the lens of the Federation in one of his newest aircrafts, he could not help but think that, from such an elevated position, they looked a little different from those of the Crimea. But though they, but though they might not have looked different, they very much were, and not a day went by when he did not think of the plight boot both of his homeland and of his people, the Crimean Tartars. The Nazi jackboot had fallen on them over 20 years ago and showed no signs of being lifted any time soon. I can't hear anything. Indeed, from what little news had reached Central Siberia from those lands, the entire peninsula had been treated as a colonial project by the German Kriegsmarine, and his people had, as they would be expected, suffered terribly. To those few countrymen he had spoken to over the years, there was little hope of ever changing this, and for a long time he had thought the same. But the aircraft he now sat in had changed these thoughts. The Federation had made challenges, yes, but unlike many of the states around it, it was still innovating. It was still designing, while others looked to the past, it was looking forward, socially, techn technically, economically, militarily. It was looking forward to unification of Central Siberia and eventually with luck beyond. Perhaps in time, it could once again look upon the lands of the Crimean Tartars. And on the day the lands below his aircraft would not just look like his homeland, they would be them. A day, day to one to them one day realized. Or to realize one day. I don't know. The fruits of the Siberian plan. Novo Siberia was one of the places that benefited the most from Bukharan Siberian plan since these times. Or limes. Or aims. Our industry has seen a large step up and is up up. The Federation's economy is still developing because of it, with new factories continuing to open, advancements being made in construction technology and in the expansion of infrastructure across the state. All these factors have greatly improved our industrial efficiency, allowing us to produce a greater volume of equipment for our military, bringing us another step closer to national reunification. Now, so now we can do this one. Um, we could do it, but eh, we'll do it anyways, why not? Sca oh, he was through the butt. That's okay. A day on the kid farm, there was a knock on the door. Dimitri left from his desk and rushed to the door. He knew his visitor was not the sort of man who could stand waiting for too long. Good day, gentlemen. Do come in. The gentleman walking into Dimitri's laboratory did not return their host's sequence, sequenced smile. They were professional errand boys, and they were... Here to run an errand, is the cargo ready? Asked the one on the right. Right this way, Dimitri led his guest towards the kennels at the back of the lab. As the man approached, a woman dropped, uh, stopped petting one of the foxes inside in a cool, correct manner. Stepped to the side, allowing Dimitri to display the merchandise. The kit, seeing new playmates, congregated at the front of the kennel, tails wagging. The two visitors sat set straight to the work, removing the food and water dishes before carrying kennels to a waiting truck outside. For all that is necessary to keep our research funded, I worry about the, where these foxes will end up, said Lu... Ludmilla, Dimitri's assistant, as she and he hurried to clean and refill the dishes the couriers left. They're like, they're like, they'll likely get sold off to markets in Brittany, and from there, if my theories prove correct, they'll become the latest trend in exotic pets. The sort of people who buy pets off the black market generally aren't the most humane sort. The two continued working in silence between the couriers' return trips until the truck was finally loaded. How much for that fox window? Too much. The Virgin Lands campaign, crackdown and strikes. 
Sure. Uh, let's get the military factors first. We're above arms production, which is important. The army will need more arms if it is to continue to expand large enough to absolutely dominate the region and bring the rest of the central Siberia region into the Federation, though through threats or force. An increase in, in production quotas for all armaments is to be ordered by the government to help with expansion of the armed forces. Many of the recent actions of the government have upset the workers. This is unlikely to improve the situation, though. And if the tensions persist, grave consequences will face the Federation in the future. But it is what it is. Spoils to, to the deserving. After we see what we got here. Scavenge for loot. Yes, please. Come on, I just want to loot some booties. Ah. Mikhail was a man who had long been active in the Federation's industrial landscape. He owned several and had bought and sold many more factories and plants of all kinds. For many years, it had been a difficult existence, but no longer. Now the rewards long promised were finally being delivered. The benefits pledged by the Siberian plan had been realized, and economic activity within the Federation was rapidly increasing both vertically and horizontally. That meant more factories, jobs, and production. And it was also critical for Mikhail and his contemporaries meant more money. Lots, lots more money. He'd been watching the stock market all morning, and the ash shares listed upon it had done nothing but rise for his company, for the companies of his friends, and most of all for the companies that the government had chosen to favor. Even better, the rise showed no signs of stopping. It was truly a great day, of course. There were those who claimed the money was not going anywhere it was needed, or that it should be redirected to those to more who need it more. But with an exact definition of that need left purposely nebulous. But Mikhail paid them no mind. Wherever the money was going otherwise, enough was coming to him. And truly, was anyone else more deserving? The fruits of labor. And we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm, but... Arosia, finally. Hopefully we can do well. Our divisions aren't that great. They're like 10 to 12 combat width, so obviously not that good, but we'll see. And then crack down on strike, uh, crack down on strikes. Workers have started to resort to direct action. Factors like dormant and hollow throughout every city. Production is slow to a sluggish space. We can only assume that the workers have become uppity because of their unfair conditions, but we cannot concede, or they will soon be asking for the earth. Our government has determined to crush these strikes and put the working classes back to work. The crackdowns will escalate tensions with the workers, but a few disgruntled factory laborers being put back to work will be a much more preferable outcome than the constant deadlock and economic inefficiency. And let's go on in, boys. Let's see what happens. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, consumer goods, consumer goods, yes. Decreases the output, that's fine. I'm going to do both of these, so we'll do this one first. That's fine. Four is not great. The tribute pay, they actually pay the tribute. Look at that, great. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. It feels weird that we're finally getting this, but, like, that thing, because we usually re-raid much quicker than, than that, but whatever. And then, actually, you know what? I'm going to wait to read the next one. I want to get agricultural methods next. That'd be good. <clears throat> In about three days, not bad. And has time for more coffee. Actually, we're going to need a lot more guns. We're going to need way more guns. Good, good, good. Get more research speed. Thank you. Not too far behind on research speed, so that's good. You can lower that. I want more construction speed, too. So, like I see the Tiberian plan. Minus 2% consumer goods. Not bad. Uh, how many guns are we out? Way too many because we are out 1,000. We're trying to make two divisions. Uh, maybe make... Uh, keep making two for now. <clears throat> the Virgin Lands Campaign. A new plan has emerged from our government to help alleviate the large amounts of stress that has finally put that has been put on our agricultural output. Put simply, as our population has inflated, our production of grain has not. The issue is rapidly becoming the greatest crisis in Nova Sibiris and besides the enduring pandemic. Fortunately, the plan of our government has come up with de deals with both the food shortage and the disproportionate population by resettling refugees in the farmsteads where the land is yet to be cultivated. Ultimately, this will start looking or improving the agricultural output and the lives of the refugees. Oh, Kemerovo, what do you want from us? You dudes will regret striking us. Any upgrades, maybe? That'd be kind of nice. A girl's assaulter, yeah. Go offensive. And you, Nestor Kozin, is looking pretty good. Crack down on some of them. Strikerinos. The Virgin Lands. We love Virgin Lands. Medjunio, managerial response. Seven days left. Thousands of workers were on strike outside of the steel mill in the industrial sector of Nova Sibirsk. All across the city, a similar structure were being carried out in outrage of the appalling conditions present, present in the factories. Corporate security guards made a loose and patchy ring around the striking workers, waiting for orders from the superiors to ju on just what to do. Vasily Minkowski stood in front of the crowd and gave a fiery speech about the injustices of the corporations. He harkened back to the towns under Bukharin, where the workers were given generous rights and conditions in the factories they were safe as they could be made. Behind him was a hung was hung a tattered flag of the Soviet Union. The workers of Nova Sibirsk had decided they would not stand for the continued abuse. As he came in, came to a lull in his oratory, there was a change in the air. The corporate goons had retreated to the offices across the street, and it soon became obviously why. Two corporate IFBs rolled down the street towards the crowd, a man with a megaphone calling for the strikers to return to work. When his demands were unanswered, the IFBs unleashed canisters of tear gas into the crowd. Cries went up as those <clears throat> unleashed... Uh, uh, 
as those nearest the gas panicked and fled, eyes and lungs burning. Corporate goons advanced on the crowd, beating those that caught with the tongs. Then the shot rang out. Panicking, workers trampled each other to get out of the line of fire while corporate security fired wantonly into the crowd. Vasily tried to regain some semblance of calm, but it was it was in vain as he was hit by the by in the gut by a burst of fire from a panicked guard. <clears throat> he fell. Reaching for the flag of the Union. As he bled out watching his friends be gunned down by trigger happy guards, he wept, all for the pursuit of profit. Cool. An ultimatum? We will not back down so easily. Alright, they're attacking us. They're attacking us. Let's see what happens. We only have two divisions there, but hopefully it's over river. Civil Rights Act is passed in America. Oh, we're so lo slowly losing, but if we throw more divisions, we should do okay. Nice, nice. They're throwing in another division as well, but these guys are looking pretty tired and weak. Actually, we have we don't have everyone in there yet, so... Okay, they're... Hey, look at that. Enemies defeated. If you like to read about that, please go right ahead. We've got some more guns, some political power, and stability. Thank you very much. Look how happy this guy is. Nikolai. Oh, he's so happy. Nice. I just want to beat up Orochia again. Nice. Oh, look, we have nine factories. When do we get another one? Huh. Let's see. Quotas. Takushku Super Goods. Nice. Now we're currently at what? Minus 30%? Not enough. The beating heart of Siberia. Novosibirsk thrives. The streets are brimming with people. Factories are chock full of workers. And any crime that remains practically unnoticed. The city is so rich that even the few beggars that re remain appear fed and decently clothed. Such spectacles are a certain contrast to the anarchy of the East and destruction to our West. It appears that our decisions have turned out better than we could have ever expected, but not that there was any doubt of their success. Developments in agriculture, industry, and even our stability have made Novo Sibiris the most desirable city throughout Siberia, despite the cost of some freedoms. Not bad. Hmm, cool. For a lens, new beginnings. Konstantin had been rootless for many years. Originally from Tembov, he and his family had fled eastwards during the German invasions and subsequent state and collapse, and, like so many others, had found themselves with almost nothing, having to leave all lands and possessions behind. Arriving alongside thousands of others in the refugee communities outside Novosibirsk, it scrapped by as a laborer when able. While his wife worked in a laundry and his sons ran errands for merchants and artisans, but no matter what they did, they could not get ahead. There were simply too many people and not enough well-paying jobs. The years of bitter disappointment were such that when his wife told him to sign up for the government's supposed new program, he had almost not done so, thinking it was pointless. But now, standing along the road beside her, and looking at the vast tracts of overgrown wild lands in front of them, he suddenly gave thanks once again because the land was now theirs. The program intended to address the refugee problem by settling them on vast tracts of untiled land, removing them from the overpopulated communities while hopefully acting to increase agricultural output. Constantine did not know how successful that former might be, but he knew that, that very well, at least in his case. The latter very much would be. He would make sure of it. <clears throat> There was a lot of very hard work to do. The house had to be essentially rebuilt. The fields needed to be cleared, cleared and planned. Harvest needed to be planned. Constantine had never been a farmer, but the future promise for his family could not be ignored. They had a home again, a land to call their own. And he would ensure that the state was repaid for its generosity. The state does provide. And the champions of industry, let's do the internal situation. The internal situation within the Federation has continued to deteriorate in recent months. Leftist revolutionaries have tried to undermine the stability of the state. Their methods of doing so have become increasingly incredibly heinous. The government will have to make difficult decisions on the freedoms of the people in order to take a harsh stance on such dangerous dissent. Once the internal situation has been dealt with, we must hope that the regime will be strengthened enough to turn our attention on our enemies that threaten the region. And enemies within and without. So we did this. Um, we're doing research speed. Once the research speed is done, I think... Let's go ahead and start improving our guns. That'll give us a, maybe an incredibly slight advantage over other people. Or other warlords, really, so. Alright. Uh, I see. Efficiency gain goes lower. Okay. Nice. Uh, we have no penalties yet, so that's pretty good. Enter the situation. And we got a few more factories, hopefully. Yeah, maybe. 63. That's going to take a while, but that's okay. I want to do the, uh, the corporations next. Or maybe the last. Meet with Shushkin. The president of the Federation, Alexander Polkrishkin, is to meet with the mayor of Barno. For the heir, he has become a, there, be, there has become a need to discuss the issues that are key to the lives of the people of Barno and the future strength of the Federation as a whole. Barno is rich in agriculture, food that is desperately needed in the overpopulated cities throughout the Federation. An agreement must be made between the two parties, otherwise both their prospects will be, will be bleaker. We must hope that Polkrishkin finds a beneficial settlement with the mayor for the betterment of both people. The people's apocalypse. Uh, oh. I think I already read this one before. If you like to read about this one, please go right ahead. It is what it is. It's a you know a story that happens every time. So, cool. Scam for loot. Yes, please. We love raiding booties. Arosia. Ah, my punching bag. Our punching bag. Look, they don't have any manpower. A situation report. Look at that. 
Now, when does Orochi go to get a focus tree? That'd be kind of cool. That'd be really difficult as them, but that'd be really cool. A religious divide. Christian socialism. All right. And like I said, the Siberian plan is going okay for them. Not great. And let's go click on meeting with Shushkin. And anything else here? Not too much. Yeah, not too much. Cool. The president placed another sheet of paperwork beside before the ink from his signature had even dried, trying to work through a week of red tape in an hour before he was to meet with Glinka. Now, that hour was almost upon him as his eyes flicked between the clock just above the door and the paperwork before him. Finally, breaking the tension, the rapping of Glinka's knuckles at the door could be heard. Come on in, Dimitri. The door swung open and Dimitri shuffled in, holding a stack of papers, dropping it on Alexander's desk and adding onto the mound already collected there. What's all this? asked Alexander, lifting up the first sheet of paper, glancing to his old friend first. Police report. The workers and the socialists... Are getting much more agitated with the conditions. This is twice as many civil arrest related arrests as last month. Concerning. Nodded Alexander, but predictable. I figured there'd be at least more of a catalyst, though. There is. The grain shortages are getting worse, which means less food for the workers, which means they're taking to the streets so they can simply earn more money to feed themselves with the grain that we simply do not have. Christ, I'll see what I can do, and I'll keep looking through these. Dimitri nodded and headed back out the door. Stopping just short of the threshold, he turned to hear another word from his president and keep up with the good work, Dimitri. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh wait, they're getting raided. Oh come on, man. What? Okay, the tribute. Okay, they've actually paid the tribute. That's good. Okay, I'm fine with that. They got raided. No, we demanded tribute after they started getting raided. So they're fighting for nothing, maybe. So that's actually really good for us then. Nice. Production networks. Yeah, why not? Already too discontent. Who cares? And then the security question. Law enforcement has steadily become more and more difficult as tensions between the government and political agitators have led to terrorist attacks, which are suspected to have been orchestrated by rebellious socialists. These cowardly actions have caused a great deal of domestic instability, which cannot be allowed to continue. Security will have to be improved in order to combat the threat that our terrorists, or that the terrorists have posed to our future. Let's say we'll have to make th these changes in order to maintain law and order. A meeting in Barnall. Sorry, I don't have much time for pleasantries, but we really must get down to business. Burgundy's finally done it. Alexander Pokrishkin was blunt as usual as he sauntered into Shushkin's mayoral, mayoral office in Barna. The president was there in person to negotiate for further grain imports to the city in light of the growing threat of famine in the capital. Of course, Mr. President, Shushkin nodded, gesturing towards a seat across from his desk at which Pushkin quickly filled. People are dying, Mayor. This needs to stop, and soon. Right, how much grain do you need? How much can you give me? Not enough to end any famines, but enough to last you until we have more stable supplies, certainly. It's not really entirely my grain. Several businesses which moved into the region had bought up the farms, which makes securing food for the state and moving it considerably harder. It's a supportive facility. Oh, Christ, I'll see what I can do, replied Shushkin, picking up the phone and sliding open a drawer full of variable scrap paper scribbled with phone numbers. This may take a bit. I'll get back to you with, with some numbers soon. Enough. Very good. Consumer goods, yes. Consumer goods, consumer goods, consumer goods, consumer goods. Yes, please. Infinite consumer goods. Minus 37%. Shop for shop. May I, may I interest you in a drink, Paul Krishkin said, keeping a careful eye over his guest, Mr. Shushkin. They sat in the living room of the president's house. From the walls sounded the clanging, chittering of daily vagrancy, vagaries, while the fireplace before them crackled, radiating heat and light. You look like you could use one. Indeed, you may, Shushkin said. My throat is parched. He laughed. The farmers expect an orator, and I'm afraid I don't have the voice for it. It's tough being a mayor. He met Paul Krishkin's eyes, but imagine it's harder to be a president. Paul Krishkin gave him a wry smile. You don't even know the half of it. The president of the Federation unscrewed a bottle of vodka and poured its contents into two shot glasses, handed the other to the Shushkin, and raised his cup to eye level to the Federation. To the Federation, Shushkin returned his toast, and down the spirit in one gulp. But Krushkin did the same. That is some good strong vodka. It's hard finding a good distillery this far east. Is it grain? Yes. Fruits of cooperation between Barno and the rest of the Federation. But Krushkin smiled. Deeds, not words. Shushkin is how we will hold this Federation together. The sat in silence. While well, the fireplace crackled, one more drink. Please, please, please. Federalism? More federalism. Now, I don't know what's going to happen here, but we can do our best. Now, we know that research facilities are slowly getting worse, but we can improve it slightly by increasing it. So let's do that one first. Research facilities? Yes, please. God, I just want to raid their booties. Let me raid. Uh, sometimes you guys don't like it when I hurt consumer goods, but for construction speed, that's also, at least in my mind, extremely, extremely important. And it doesn't hurt us that much, so. Especially early on, when construction speed could be really, really beneficial, but it didn't help us that much, but that's okay. Watchful enforcers. Oh, America's going to go to war with Guyana. Very cool. Um, did I read any of these yet? Maybe not. A renewed contract? Yes, please. A conclusion on the future relationship of Bodnall and Novus is about to be reached between President Pokrushkin and Major or Mayor Vasily Shushkin. He will learn of the benefits of living under the authority of Pokrushkin. Shushkin will also be made aware of the need to pay for such a vital service. Shushkin will have to listen to our demands for the sake of the Barnall security he will offer his farmlands. The fertile lands of Barnall will be used for the betterment of the entire population of the Federation, not just the people who live under the mayor. He will learn that we, he must cooperate with their interests. Watchful encounters, or enforcers, really. 
Anything else here? Nope. It was far from a usual day for the everyday people of Nova Sibiris. Confused glances and shocked stares were aimed at the new presence on the streets. Geezers which were quickly turned away once they were returned. This was the police they thought, not the police they knew. They were better armed, there were a lot more of them, and they looked, da looked downright mean. It was clear that they meant business, and in Nova Sibiris, there was little more valuable than meaning business. A few people whispered here and there, a friend of the friend had said this or that about the government wanting to eradicate terrorism, and that the police presence was to keep an eye on the ordinary people that Nova Sibiris, or that the Narodex, blended in so easily. Soon, the whole street knew the news, and then the streets nearby, and then the end, by the end of the day, everyone in the city knew that they might be unknowingly watched at any moment. For once, all the complaints of the citizenry was silenced, as all their usual brazen bravery frozen in place. Instead of the usual dissatisfaction of the age, they felt something they hadn't felt in a long time. Fear. Every boot that hit the ground, every glare that shot across at a gathered crowd, every officer placed at a key position to keep watch as all, as all manner of people passed by, served only to reinforce that fear, a sort of dread comparable to being caught in the spider web with no escape. As the days passed and the people grew to the, used to the officers, however, the sense of fear settled down into a feeling of security of protection. The spider's web had begun to feel more like a safety net for the common person. As for the uncommon person, the narrow no, neck, the spy, the common thief, the spider quickly began to feast, and when the screams soon silenced, they were heard at night. Nobody questioned why some officers needed their uniforms cleaned. It was better that way. A secure federation is a free federation. Ah, very good, my friends. Very, very good. Expand the security agencies, but corporate warfare. Warfare? Or the Phantom Threat. In the city of Nova Sibiris, a group of men in corporate uniforms marched in the streets. They had been sent by Sibir HQ to intimidate the owners of a small steel mill in the industrial, uh, industrial sec district and sector. At the hair head was a young officer by the name of Andre Ugolev, a rising star... Not Tsar, but tsa Star! In the corporate security world, they approached the mill from the south, truncheons in hand. From the north, however, came another group of corporate guards. These men, from Phoenix by the looks of them, were armed with rifles and occasional gunshot or shotgun. As the two groups came near to another, a third faction made themselves known. Around the entryway to the mill, a third group of workers laid, led by a strange mercenary sat behind the makeshift barricades. Armed with an assortment of old Soviet-era rifles and pistols, they were led by a well-armed stranger clad in an old uniform. When the two corporate teams caught sight of one another, all heck bro broke loose. The more heavily armed group opened fire, killing and wounding most of Ugolev's men. As he huddled behind a low wall around the mill, he attempted to rally them, only to find they had been either died or fled. The workers let their displeasure be known. Then, as a stranger leading them shouted an order and opened fire on the corporate goons, the mill workers' sudden intervention came as a shock to the Phoenix Force, who were just able to secure over half after half of their numbers were killed. The stranger then pulled a small object from a pouch on his belt before throwing it into the middle of the remaining Fennec forces. An ear-splitting bang in a shower of shrapnel was the last thing they knew before they were ripped apart. Andre looked around at the dead men all around him, his friends and enemies, and could only feel sort of numb acceptance. When he woke this morning, he had been somebody, a rising star. After today, he would be lucky to beg for scraps at the corporate HQ. The rising star must fall in the end. This, okay, so with all these corporations and the workers' discontent, it really reminds me, I don't know why, but of like the outer worlds. Like, all the corporations and the workers being disgruntled and stuff, that reminds me so much of the Outer Worlds. The Phantom Threat. <clears throat> Don't let him get away! The security man shouted at the top of his lungs as he hunted the assassin. He's the one who tried to kill the president! Despite all of his efforts, there was little he could do to disperse the crowds that were fleeing in every direction after the sound of the two missed gunshots echoed in the Nova Sibiris Square. He turned around once to see Pokrishkin with his characteristic uniform being escorted by a uh, squad of agents to safety, somewhere near his residence, but he could not lose track of the assassin as he headed into the narrow roads of the city. With all the energy he had left in him after this exhausting day of preparations, he ran as fast as he could, jumping over objects and pushing over civilians, but always keeping his eyes on the target. However, as he saw him reach the o Oktobriski Bridge and jumped over the railing, he shouted in vain one last time as the killer fell into the freezing waters of the Alb River. Two days later, Bokrishkin was in a highly classified meeting in the presidential residence, together with Security Minister Klinka. Glinka. The proof had been laid in front of him, as it was clear as day. The Narodniks were behind the recent attempt on his life. The trail of evidence had been followed by his trustworthy subordinates, and now it was time for the justice to be served. Things, sir, are now different. Glinka's hesitation in his voice was obvious, but he continued no nonetheless. We thought the Narodniks were simple nuisance to the Federation, a small group that could be rooted out. This assassination attempt proves the exact opposite. They are a credible threat with influence in the underworld, and one which will have to be dealt with. There are already security measures in place, but we must go further. We must launch a war against this terror. But Krishkin nodded in agreement. Do what you must. Well, that sucks. That, I'm not clicking that. Nope. I don't want to hurt our political power and war support and factory output. Nope, 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 nope. More guns. Oh, 10% more soft attack. That is extremely important. Wow, that is really good, actually. Uh, quotas. Uh, capacity might not be bad. Let's give her PP, though. PP is a resource that we don't want to waste. 
uh, expand security agencies. Due to the recent increase in Narodnik terrorist activities in major cities, President Pokorshkin has assigned an executive order expanding the powers of the Suzba Bezopasnosti, or the SB. As the main federal security agency in Novosibirsk and Barnal, the SB has kept the Federation safe from socialist and anarchist agitation almost since its foundation. Now, with these new powers, the SB should be able to act with impunity against social terrorists without intervention from local or federal agencies or federal governments. With the Narodniks, must be ended as soon as possible, unless they begin to cause chaos. And the SB is the only thing that will get the right, the job done right. We create an intelligence agency. Nice. Oh, God, our stability in the war now. Gosh darn it. What a bunch of terrorists. Uh, but investigate the Narodniks. One of the largest known terrorist groups that have been carrying out attacks against the people of Novosibirsk is called Narodniks. The group is composed of socialist agitators who are, who are attempting to topple the Falcon's regime. They have perpetuated the violence within our borders for too long and they will have to be dealt with directly. Firstly, we will have to investigate the movements of the group to begin to understand how it functions as well as who is involved. But surely after that we will have to start clamping down on their atrocious crimes. Good. So after this, we want to do more industry, which we I do want to do... And we need more output and stuff like that. We're, so, my goal is always one infantry, one industry research, as well as one military research, including land doctrine, guns, stuff like that. So, Pavlodar, uh, how strong are they? Do they make any more divisions? 9,000 manpower. Well, they actually lost a division. Ooh, that is not bad. Orochia has nothing there. Ooh, we might be able to win, but our guys are not that strong. Hmm. We could try. We could risk it. And they do have uh, normal uh, militia infantry. Where would this take place, though? That is my question. Not entirely sure. So that's, that actually really sucks. So just in case, do like there, maybe? Maybe it's just against Pablo Dar proper, but I don't know. Uh, what's this? More output? Uh, I want to wait. <clears throat> nice. Conserve democracy. Libertarian socialism, authoritarian democracy. Cool. Anything else here? Oh, peace conference is over. Between who? Oh, Guyana's gone. Cool. Uh, we can't wait. I want to wait for consumer good stuff, so. Let's see if we can do this. Scam loot? Yes, please. Do that one. They don't have anything on. Any support. Oh, they just paid the tribute. Great! Thank you for the political power, my friends. I love it. And then a firm grip. Stability has to be increased within the Federation. We cannot risk any form of dissent in case it evolves into a more violent form of resistance. We cannot allow violence to occur. We owe the people peace within the borders that they live. They surely understand this. The government has to tighten its control over the state. After all, they are aware of the dangerous alternatives of stronger authority. Because of this reason, they must be allowed to strengthen the grip. They know what is and what is not good for the Federation, and they'll make sure everyone is safer. Yes. We can read that. Anything else here? Not really too much. Factory output. How many guns are we missing? Oh, we're not even making a jack squat. Holy... Ah, oh, I hate these terrorists. God. The investigation begins, though. Glinka came up to the stage and reached for the podium's old microphone. In front of him were tens of security officers. Some he could recognize from the Federation's first days when it was separated from the failed CSR. And they were the ones with distinctly more medals on their uniforms. Others, younger in age, were less decorated, but could see their eagerness to work in their eyes. Look at all this over here. My fellow NSB members, a looming threat has appeared, one threatening to tear apart what we have worked so hard to build. Blinka knew he had to speak decisively to get the message across. The Narodniks, unconvinced by our noble state and institutions, continue to wage a campaign of terror and have, in fact, ramp up their efforts, as has recently been made clear. It is our duty to restore order to these lands and eliminate the Red Menace before it eliminates us. President Pokrushkin has outlined specific measures to be taken through which we can fight these radicals. As leading NSB officials, it is your duty to implement them. And thank you, and God bless Novosibirsk and Altai. Why did you lowercase g in God? What the heck? Throughout the next few weeks, the security service got to work. Hundreds, if not thousands, were arrested, sometimes due to blatantly clear socialist connections and others due to mere rumors. And dark alleys of the greatest, biggest cities, as well as in the mountainous countryside fit for resistance cells, many were caught occasionally after, even after being ratted from civilians. However, inside the government and the agencies, there was still a sense that this was the beginning of something bigger, a general campaign against the terror. True death or not, next once and for all, the question is, will it succeed? Crush them. Oh, he's command power. Good idea. Thank you, devs. All right, not bad. Increase patrols. Conduct inter internal investigation. We could probably do that. I want to increase patrols and do an internal investigation too. Yep, mountain patrol. The soldiers of Nova Sibirsk, exhausted, exhausted after hours of slogging through the rugged terrain of Altea, threw down their packs and slumped against the stones. The bitter Russian wind snaked through the mountains, peaks, slicing little bits of flesh upon the faces of the men huddled in the rocks. Jerky was passed out. A fire started. 
72 hours, friends, said Lichtin, opening a letter and pressing the resulting tongue of flame to his crudely rolled cigarette. We've been out here for cutting our feet bloody and uh, crapping behind rocks for three bad word days. Hey, Boris! Lichtin tossed a pebble at a dozing soldier and still plinked off his old Soviet helmet. Boris grunted, suddenly straightening. Bad word off, Lichtin. I was just dreaming about plowing your sister. The smoking soldier ignored him. You see any Nordniks around here? How about you, Luka? He pointed at the mustachioed sniper who looked wearily over the rocks. No, mumbled Luka, adjusting his ushanka. No, not a single one of us has been has seen hide nor hair of a Nordnik since we started patrolling the Altai. I'm starting to think those geniuses and intelligence messed up. The men joked and complained, dozed off against the rocks, and packed up several hours later. As we moved deeper into the mountains, the hidden eyes continued to watch from afar. Just who is tracking who? Oh boy. Who is tracking who? Well, at least we're going to get, uh, increase patrols. And now, finally, that thing is happening. Uh, Ludmila Lezevera, rescue operative. Yes, Ludmila. And then the Silovic State. In contrast to its neighbors in the region, the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altea is a Silovic State, a polity where the political processes are under the guiding hand of the former and sometimes current military personnel. As a result, many civilian bureaucrats wishing to participate in traditional party politics find themselves barred from running for office, and the compliance demanded by the Soloviks of the non military counterparts can often be too much. And all of this, they are by design. Russia has moved past the need for a Soviet Union, for a central Siberian Republic, or for the monstrous and brutal ideologies that seek to dominate Russian political thought. The pedestrians may chant, Bad word, Siloviki, my man, at every injury, but they are not aware of the bastard that protects us but the heart of ideological thought. More war support and political power? Sign us up. Thank you very much. We almost have a billion in GDP, too, which is very nice. Very, very good. Oh, we can get new schools? Oh, look at that. Equipment. Thank you. Output is not great. We could probably improve that, though, realistically. Silovik State. Thank you very much. I would like to raid some more, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. And the champions of industry. Oh, cabin in the woods. Lickkin squinted at the shape that stood in the small clearing ahead of him. Ash fell absently from the cigarette dangling from his teeth. It was a decrepit old structure, all rotten wood and broken glass, a door hanging loosely from his frame like a broken jaw. The patrol had followed the little game trail through the Alte forest for hours, assuming that they were once again following a... a lead long coal, but there it was, squatting in the shadows of the trees like a withered hag. Well, boys, said Lickin, his breath missing slightly in the cold mountain air. Shall we knock? The patrol advanced, weapons held at the ready, bodies hunched low. Boris, rifle aloft, stepped carefully through the underbrush, eyes searching the tree line, and ears pricked for any unusual sounds he should have looked down. It was an old weapon, buried in the fallen leaves and primed with a short length of wire. The Germans called them S-mines, the Russians frog mines. A short crump sound issued from the ground as the mine launched itself into the height of Boris's belly. The Russians' eyes bulged obses obstinately, pure terror contorting his face. A microsecond later, the mine exploded, throwing thousands of steel balls hurtling through the air and through Boris. The patrolman was gutted in an instant, the other soldiers flinging themselves to the ground. Lincoln screamed for everyone to stop moving, having to yell over Boris's gurgle howls as he died in pieces. Fear, cold, and icy poured down their backs. They weren't alone up here. Poor dude. Oh my goodness, that is not good. Actually, this one's done. Actually, let's get that one done first. But faster, patrolman, kill, kill. Lincoln fixed the little brick house with a cruel eye. It had been days, a week after Boris had died, and the Nova Zobirsk men had quickly fallen back into military form, knocking off the rest of the Langur. Luca watched the building through his scope, a score of Narodniks and camo around the similarly painted building, eyes nervous and guns held close. A search of the cabin had revealed little at first. After a lengthy search, the patrolman had discovered the burned remains of Narodnik documents in the fireplace, indicating a new safe house in the Alte. It took an hour's painstakingly piercing the burned bits of paper back together, but now the patrolman lay in wait for the enemy. Lickin, cigarettes absent for once, raised his pistol, waving for his men to advance. They killed the first few terrorists with, an, with knives, spilling red onto the green. A firefight soon erupted, the crack pop, and rifles and pistols, sending not flocks of birds to take the, to the air after a brief second. Uh, but fierce gun battle outside the building, the patrolman assaulted the safe house, breaching the metal door of the grenades before rushing inside. The actual battle took at most half an hour, but to Lickin and his patrol, it felt like an eternity. Uka was injured, a bloody shoulder, but nothing as few stitches and some vodka would have fixed. Hands shaking, Lika reached down to grab a cigarette, but found that he couldn't feel his ever-present pack. He looked down and was shocked to discover that the first two fingers of his left hand were gone. Lickin stared at the bloody ruin of his hand, shocked and adrenaline having shielded him from the pain. Numbly, he began to wrap it in a disregarded shirt. The work here was done, another threat to Nova Zabiris dealt with. Nothing a little R&R &R won't cure. Okay, investigation progress will increase. Okay, so that's looking a little bit better for us. And then, last final raid, let's conduct uh, factories and internal investigation. Let's do that one, so we don't hurt ourselves. Co communist sympathies. Love swallowed, throat constricting, a dry gulp that brought no comfort. The bespeckled officer sat in front of him, looming over the private end of this great desk. The officer, likely a veteran of the Great Patriotic War, thrown through Love's service record and personal papers. 
Uh, he had not spoken since Levitt entered the room, leaving the private to sit in an uncomfortable and terrible silence. Finally, as sweat was starting to bead on his forehead, the eyes behind the glasses rolled up uh, to meet his Mr. Goro Gongcharo. He began as a voice as dry as parchment. I understand you come from a proletarian background. Your father, Andrei Viktorovich, was a labor agitator in Gorky. Your mother, a worker in the automotive factory. Both, he said, in eyes narrowing, active members of the Communist Party. Silence settled on the room. And it was clear that the officer expected Lev to say something. Ah, uh, he started. A voice cracked from the lack of moisture and fear. Yes, that's correct. Sir, I was um, raised to be a communist, but... Lev hastened to add as the officer's steely gaze fixed him like a butterfly in a glass. Of course, so was everyone else in those days. I'm a proud member of the all Siberian army, and I, uh... I myself have no social sympathy, sir. The officer continued to stare for several agonizing seconds, as if picking apart Lev's words. Very well, Private Goncharov. You may leave. Lev hastily saluted and left the room, restraining himself from bolting like a startled hare. Once he was out of the room, he let out a breath he did not know he had been holding. Things had been heating up in the army, and questionings like these were becoming more commonplace. What worried Lev most of all was the uncertainty of it. He had passed the officer's test or not. Better dead than red, am I right, fellas? Oh, look at this. Get some goods? Sure, why not? And the champions of industry. One hallmark that distinguishes the Federation of Novo Sibirsk and Altai from the likes of the mystical king of Kimorovo, the Black Army in Kansk, and the Republic in Tomsk is the presence of corporations that dominate the daily life of its citizens. Three of the most dominant are the Phoenix, Sibir, and Titan, each specializing in different sectors of the economy. The Phoenix, the most aggressively pro silovic of all of them all, are manufacturers of military equipment. The Sibir, who are vaguely aligned with the Mayor Shushkin and Barnall, as a primary source of our agricultural tools as well as financial experts. Lastly, there are the Titans, who are the leading pioneers and technocrats within Novo Sibirsk society. When the time comes, President Pokrushkin will have to decide where the allegiances lie. Perhaps down the road, he may even choose the people instead. All is possible in the city where the sun sets. Now, oh, what do we have here? No raids? Disappointing. Over here? Yes. Very good. Small talk? A leak? Ah, small talk. President Alexander Pokrushkin sat across a table in Novosibirsk restaurant from his old friend Ahmet Khan Sultan. It had been a long time since he had seen his friend, and even longer since they had shared a meal. The lunch was pleasant enough at the start. They engaged in simple small talk for a time until the topic changed to the current state of the Federation. Alexander Ivanovich, my friend, I cannot help but worry. Every time I see you, it seems as if decades have passed. You seem to have lost the old fire you had once. Ahmet's uh, eyes radiated worry for his old friend. Alexander took a uh, long moment to collect his thoughts as he spoke before. Or before he spoke. If I may be honest with you, Emmet, I am tired. The realities of the Federation's position have drained me as sure as anything, Emmet. I know you do not approve of all my actions of the state we have built, but I know of, that you understand why it had to be done. The bickering and the backroom deals, this is not a world for foolish idealists, Emmet. The failures of the old Union are all around us, and the failures of the Republic are what force our hand. The people of Russia need a strong nation, led by strong men, not pointless words. You have to understand that. Pokrishkin's voice rose as he spoke. I am sorry, Alexander, but I cannot agree. The people are the most important part of the Federation. Not the soldiers and the oligarchs. They deserve better than, than to be tread upon by the boots of the army and the corporate security. Ahmed cannot help but feel as if he had wasted his breath, that nothing he could say would ever change his course. Alexander looked prepared to continue the argument, and he likely would have escalated it as well. But before he could meet, before he could, I met out but before he could, I met out a hand on his shoulder. Peace, my friend, peace. I did not come here to argue. Besides, I have meetings for the rest of the day. It was good catching up with you, my friend. Goodbye. Ideals can be a fragile thing that decrease the strength of the populace by a small amount. Cool, a leak. Captain Shiba Kazukukov had, as per construction, come alone. He was unused to the spy business as his body whip, uh, whipcord tense and sweaty under civilian clothes. He sat at his table in the cafe, appearing as unassuming and natural as possible. Slava slept nervously at his tea, but not really tasting anything but the steam. Was this, where was his contact? Minutes went by, and Slava was nervous to the point of nausea, but at last a slender man sat at the table. Slava's heart sank. No, not to him. Ludomir Tashuv, Tashuv, lieutenant in the All Siberian Army, and one time friend of Salava, was seated in front of him. Tashuv's eyes glittered as seeing his old friend across the table, but not saying a word of acknowledgement. Slava, too, kept his composure as best as he could. Andreevich began Slava, using the code name provided to him by his superiors. Talvich nodded. So he must be Borya. More nods, more nervous and knowing glances. Papers were covertly slept under the table, code words exchanged, and the meeting concluded. Two friends parted ways with a heavy heart. Once he was far away from the cafe and alone, Slava could call his superiors in the army to report Ludomir Talshev for treason. The right hand strikes down the left hand. Oh boy. Oh boy. How many guns do we not have? Oh, we got enough trucks, though. That's kind of nice. Okay, cool. Good job, guys. Oh, hey, Arosia. Time for your daily beating. A little bird says no more. Oh boy. Come on. A little bird says no more. 
Ludomor Talshev narrowed next and bedded deeply in the all Siberian army had just had it beat it down with his wife Mara after a long day's work when the boots kicked down the door. Shouts and screams erupted from the house as soldiers armed with pistols and shotguns cleared the Taoshev household. His children cried, Maria Light huddled in fear, clinging to her husband, and Ludomir stared, stunned down, staring down the barrel of a gun leveled at him. Lieutenant Taoshev said the soldier behind the shotgun, you are under arrest for treason against Novosibirsk and the Russian people. Ludomir purpled, uh, tongue working in confused terror and rage as he struggled to formulate his words. Under whose orders, Ludomir looked at the patch on the soldier's uniform. Corporal, he finally managed to spit out. The corporal spoke matter-of-factly, clearly unaware of how deeply his words would wound the captain. Captain Silva Kuzkovkov ordered your arrest. Ludomor's face felt defeat settling into his core. Good God, he had been set up. He went calmly, looking at his wife in the eyes, for perhaps for the last time. Don't worry, darling. I'll be home soon. And now we have no more command power. But after this one, Champions of Ministry, I would like to let, ask you guys, which one should we do? The Rising Phoenix with the increased uh, Phoenix support versus the Siberian Bear with Sabir. Should we do Glory to the Pioneers for Titan, or should we do the Populace? Let me know in the comments below. And really, which one of those corporations and or the Populace should we support? The Sabir, Titan, Fennec, or the Populace? Let me know in the comments below, because I would like your opinion on that. And let's see if we can beat these people up real quick. Ooh. Let's go ahead. And should be paid. Very good. Very, very good. And I think, actually, we will probably end it there. Maybe we'll do infiltrate the cells, but maybe we'll just end it here. If you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we will decide who we shall support, and maybe we'll beat up Orosia some more. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.